Good morning, afternoon, evening, or whenever you're watching this, everyone. I am Captain Foley. And that, of course, means I am Commander Cockins, and we are back. Team Trek Yards is back to dish out all the facts and info on a ship that I think you've all been desperate to learn all about. Desperate. We're here. Yes. We're doing it finally. Yes, and while that is true, the real question regarding this episode, Commander, is will our audience join us or fire on us? Send them my compliments. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. Good one and a, a good movie. So the topic of today's episode is from one of the original series movies. The one in which we actually see a lot of new ships of all kinds, from new enemy ones, civilian transports, new experimental prototypes, and even certain scientific survey cruisers. That's right. And the good commander is, of course, referring to Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. The ship in question is the USS Grissom, also known as the Oberth class. So let's delve right into today's episode and see if we can teach you a few things about this pretty unique design. And also, the I have also... one. T oh. I, oh, sorry, I have one too, but mine's not assembled yet. Still in dry dock. Yes, it's modular design, which we'll talk about later. It's very modular. And this is the Eagle Moss one, and they did a really good job on this because it's such a small ship. It's so big. Yeah. As a scale, so it's really meaty. The Oberth class was a small Federation starship used primarily by Starfleet and civilian scientists alike as a scout class, science survey vessel, transport, or supply ship from the late 23rd to 24th century, being named after the 20th century German rocket pioneer Hermann Oberth, which I never knew. These were introduced as a replacement for the older style Hermes and Saladin class scouts. They have 13 decks and a standard crew of only 80 personnel but can be operated by a skeleton crew of only five if required to do so. Being built with an extremely easy to build and modular design, these proved most useful for many different uh, exploration profiles requiring different specialized equipment modules. The ship was constructed with the purpose of only having extremely short mission profiles lasting only a few months, with the maximum being around two to three years at most. Originally designed to almost exclusively study astronomical phenomena, and collect data on stellar bodies, as well as conduct surface planetary scans, these ships entered service in the late 2280s and continued their service well into the 2360s. By the later half of the 2360s, however, the majority of these vessels would only serve in limited capacities, such as transport and supply ships, as newer ships with much more advanced equipment took up the mantle of scientific research and exploration. In fact, the Nova class was its direct replacement in the field of small scout scientific research vessels in the late 2360s. The designs were successful enough to critically spawn at least three subclasses, those being the Clark class and the slightly larger Gagarian class in the 23rd century, and eventually the larger still Sagan class of the 24th century. These various versions of the design served the Federation well in various important explorations, including the USS Yosemite being the first to explore and map the interior of the Badlands in 2336. These other versions of the ship employed different lower secondary hulls and were better suited to take on a more modular approach to design, as the lower sections could very easily be swapped with various styles of pods or hulls designed for specific purposes. The design of the Oberth was very atypical among Federation starships of the era. The design incorporated a unique split hull configuration, with the upper primary hull containing the saucer section, which was comprised mainly of the bridge and main crew quarters. All non-senior staff quarters were fitted with bunks, and only senior staff quarters would have a single bed to accommodate a crew of this size on so small a vessel. A large section attached to the rear of the saucer incorporated large impulse engines and supplied the mounting points for the warp drive nacelles located on either side of the saucer section. The oblong shaped secondary hull was attached to the primary or upper hull via strongly reinforced pylons. On the Oberth and Grissom specifically, this section incorporated the OC 3122W short range high resolution sensor suite. These were the best cardiographic sensors used by Starfleet at the time. Only the best for the Oberth. In sensors, anyway. Six of the Oberth class's 13 decks were located within these pylons. The secondary hull housed the warp core and a small shuttle bay, which housed two standard shuttles, uh, which were located in the aft of this section. Also, a large majority of the internal volume was dedicated to labs and scientific equipment used in survey analysis. The normal cruising speed was only warp 4, with a maximum speed of warp 5. The engines were rated for a maximum emergency speed of warp 5.8 for 12 hours, however, should the need arise. The warp drive system was built for simplicity and reliability, which of course sacrificed some speed. The engineering plant was almost wholly automated, and the engineering hull was unmanned during most normal operations. 
The entire engineering crew consisted of only one officer and four enlisted personnel. While usually assigned to explore and take more detailed scans of already discovered phenomenon or planetary bodies, sometimes the exploratory nature of the Oberth class missions meant that they would frequently discover new alien species. But the ship's small size and limited crew number meant that they had very limited diplomatic capabilities. Although they did occasionally engage in first contact procedures, it was more usual that they would make the initial assessment without revealing themselves before reporting back to Starfleet and allowing larger vessels to make the contact. Being more suited for science missions than combat missions, the Oberth class had minimal offensive and defensive capabilities. They were tactically inferior to scout class vessels of other races, such as Klingons, Gorn, or even Tholians. The weapon systems included a forward facing phase array, which was generally used to slice off chunks of spatial debris for analysis, and was generally not very powerful. There's also a single probe launcher, which of course doubled as a photon torpedo launcher should the need arise. Later versions of the ship, including some of its subclasses, had more beefed up weapon systems, with up to four phase arrays, and in some cases, even a rear facing torpedo launcher. Some were even called into service for battle during the Dominion War, and even skirmishes such as the Battle of Wolf 359. As a science vessel, it was designed with specialized shields, which were designed to allow them to push through gravitational wave fronts. In conjunction with this feature, the internal bulkheads were composed of victorium alloy, which better facilitated shielding to protect the crew. Shielding was later improved to be more resilient, should one of these vessels come under attack from an enemy vessel, or from some other phenomenon that they may encounter during their investigations. Late in its lifespan, some of these vessels were used as test beds to experiment with new equipment or technologies, the most famous, or infamous, of which was the USS Pegasus, which was equipped with an illegal Federation phased cloak cloaking technology. Many were also sold off to private companies and used as transport cargo ships, or converted to serve as diplomatic transports for shuttling dignitaries to and from diplomatic missions. But Samuel! I'm sure a lot of people out there are curious as to just how big this ship is. It's about the size of my hand, it's pretty small. But it's... Yeah, it was designed to be small, so. And as usual with Trek Yards, that's where things get dicey. <laughs> Let's discuss some of the size issues, shall we? Most of this section will be taken directly from an article over on X Asterisk Scientia, done by Bernard Schneider and Chris Spenier. Uh, we will provide a link to this article in the description below, so you can go check it out for yourself if you wish. So here goes. The Oberth class is 395 feet or 120 meters long, according to the ILM size chart for Star Trek III, and a few meters longer according to descriptions in the Star Trek encyclopedias. Now, there are a couple of problems that arise from this small size. 120 meters would simply be too small to justify its inner and outer appearance on screen. First, taking the Star Trek fat file diagrams as reference, the saucer without the bump on top would only be 6 meters tall at the 120 overall length. This window arrangement on the 120 meter Oberth would be rather silly with some decks only being 2.3 meters tall overall. One of the biggest issues is the pylons. How is the lower part of the ship accessed? A big question for us all. There are no windows, nothing else that could indicate that it's permanently inhabited as an area. The deuterium tanks may occupy the upper part, um, but if the engine room is in the lower hull, the power transfer conduits would have to go all the way up from the lower hull to the nacelles. On the other hand, if the warp core is located in the upper hull, probably both the matter and antimatter have to be rounded through the pylons. In either case, the Oberth is a bad design. No matter if the lower hull has to be frequently accessed, only a few times per day, we wouldn't consider that the transporter be used here for that purpose each time, especially if you consider the Oberth is a dated design. We have to keep in mind that at the time of TOS, intraship beaming was regarded as dangerous. However, there may have been some sort of dedicated transporter channel between the upper and lower hulls to minimise that risk. Maybe even a direct conduit or hardwire interface for the transporter signal? But there's no reason why there couldn't be a small vertical turbolift channel instead. If we assume that the turbolifts are running through the pylons as well, we get another serious problem. The pylon thickness seems to be less than 1.8 meters thick on the Star Trek Fact Files front view, and the actual photos uh, support this impression. Uh, a 1 meter by 2 meter turbolift car could barely fit through such a channel, and it would be impossible to make it follow the curves of the strut. Also, the car would seem to depart vertically and arrive horizontally in the, in the lower hull, and would have to be turned 90 degrees again upon it. If you are relying on bridge size to determine scale, then the bridge dome on top of the Grissom would only be 2 meters tall on a 120 meter ship. If you wanted to match the Enterprise, and it was a redressed set, so it should 
theoretically, then the ship would need to be 360 metres in length, which is quite a large leap from the 120 metres long scout ship. It could be that the bridge is set further down to the saucer as well, so that only the top view is exposed, but again, this makes the internal volume of the ship totally out of whack. The heavily damaged SS Vico from the TNG episode Hero Worship has four decks in the saucer. Greg Jean, who damaged the model, obviously paid attention to the window arrangement and assumed that the two visible window rows belong to decks two and four of the saucer, with deck one being the bridge dome. This would work well for a ship that was 300 meters in length. Almost 300 meters is the size at which the USS Tolstoy appears when next to the Enterprise D in the TNG episode The Naked Now. Moreover, given the crew complement of 80, as stated in the same episode, only a ship of this large size could provide all the room for the crew quarters and labs in a relatively small saucer. At the end of Star Trek Generations, however, the Oberth was, again, back to only being 120 meters at most when compared to the Nebula-class Farragut. And this is one of those things where scale, it, the length is not that helpful because the length includes this whole part. So really, the length of this is only going to be like 160, you know, 180, whatever. Yeah. Before we move on, i got to jump in, though. With We mentioned earlier three subclasses, I mean, mm. some of which are larger. Mm -hmm. But then again, they do state that these are Oberth-class vessels in the episode, which means they're the small scout ship versions. So a lot of people say that's a good reason for them looking different because they're bigger versions. But I think they actually say an Oberth-class mm -hmm. in the episode, so it is the small class scout versions. I don't know. Maybe. Anyway. Well, it depends. I mean, would you say if you if you bumped into a Constitution class refit, would you say, "Oh, look, it's a Constitution class refit"? Or would you say, "It's a Constitution class because none of the old none of the old ones exist anymore." True. True. So mm -hmm. you know, maybe the best size reference available is a Master Systems display in the episode Hero Worship. But unlike Greg Jean's model from the same episode, this MSD only has two decks in the saucer section. So Canon is not necessarily Canon. Even though it's all Canon, even though it's Canon, yeah. This again caused problems with the window placement on the exterior of the ship. Again, based on this MSD, the deck heights would be around 2 meters per deck for a ship that's only 120 meters long, but that just doesn't work. So in conclusion, the Oberth is always intended to be a very small ship, and definitely not the same size, or even bigger than the refitted Enterprise 1701. Yeah, no. Um, but its appearance does not support the 120 meters length. We have to ignore the two rows of windows in the saucer which, if those were individual decks, would require the ship to be at least 360 metres long. There is simply no way that the length of 120, and therefore only two complete decks of only 2 metres clear height inside a saucer, with a diameter of 39 metres for a lower deck and 32 metres for an upper deck, could include a standard sized bridge as seen in Star Trek 3, a computer core, quarters for 80 people, bunk beds or not, three cargo bays, and of course several science labs that would expect on the ship of this size. No. no. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> In the article, they then go on to propose four different lengths for the ship, uh, those being the 120 meters, having two decks, with all the problems we just listed, uh, making the ship not even inhabitable. I'll just stop you there, Stuart. We have fun with the fictional stuff, don't we? We do. <laughs> we also get frustrated by it very yes. easily. Yes. Next is 150 meters in length, which is probably the best compromise. Uh, this would still include two decks in the saucer. But would make the deck height reasonable, which would match what we see in the, the corridors in multiple TNG episodes. The problem being the cargo bays and turbo lifts would be misaligned a little bit. Um, the vessel would be somewhat larger, but still quite small for a crew of 80 and all the required equipment. The next size would be 220 meters, which would include three decks and would solve the problems with the visible window rows. The cargo bay doors would now be tall enough, but they would only occupy one and a half decks. The bridge could still not fit inside the dome, but have to be submerged into the saucer a bit, which I think we both kind of like as, a, as an idea. Yeah, I do. This would disregard the two-deck MSD, the Canon one, and the other Canon four-deck model done by Craig Jean. After that, we have the 300-meter version with the four decks. This allows for the correct bridge dome, as seen as the other ships of the era. At this 300 meters length, the design problems would be largely solved, but the ship would be nothing like it originally was intended to be. Um, and obviously with the island size, that was the original intent, you know. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that Constitution class, which are capital ships of this time, wouldn't be significantly larger than small scout class science vessels. Well, guys, just a quick breakdown of everything they discuss over in the article. It was an interesting read, to be sure, and I would like to thank them for putting it together and encourage you all to go read it for yourselves and make up your own minds. And just spend, uh, just spend days on that site. It's amazing. Yeah. Seriously. 
Uh, the thing is that this happens far too often with Star Trek ships that we cover here on Trek Yards. I always have real issues when I do research because one of the first things we talk about is the length. And it's always so varied on all the different research materials that I cover. So yeah. uh, oftentimes sizes don't match up to what we see on screen or even the CGI models that Samuel gets. And as we just discussed, canon is sometimes not canon even when it's canon. canon. And it's canon. Yeah, exactly. So every ship needs a page like this in a way to explain away those issues. Uh, but this one, this ship is so small that I never really considered the problems with the sizing like that uh, before researching the episode. Uh, I always thought that the Grissom was a very cool little ship, uh, but now I kind of see it in a totally different light. <laughs> and I hope you guys do as well. Hope it doesn't ruin your experience of the ship. It's a great ship. Um, but yeah, I always considered it to be small, like a bird of prey. But they, they even said in that in the movie, to praise a dozen officers and men but the grissom's 80 i don't know and you and you know this m section might be usable but it very well might not be and then mm. it's just a teeny space and even with the the deck structure and the the bunk structure yeah it's a it, it always felt like as it was purposed a shortish range midish range mm. science vessel you know it, it's almost like a runabout in a sense it's like this is just not it's just a yeah. craft that we use that we you know mass produce and do um, but yeah, I mean, 120 sounds are, sounds fine. But I don't know. Did you did you ever think that? I know we talked about this in our, our mission briefing. I think it was like mission briefing number one or two. It was, this is why we're great to finally get back to this. Yeah. Now, what did you yeah. think? Did you ever think this bit was was livid, livid space? I mean, do you think? How did you think the whole two deck I, arrangement? As a kid, I never. I always thought the secondary hull was no, nobody in it because it wasn't attached. Right. Uh, I always thought just people were just in the saucer section. That's just what my brain did as a kid. Hmm. If it had a neck, I would have thought it was sure. like the Constitution class. But I, I, I thought it was something completely different because of the way it was configured. So, yeah, and it's interesting that you mentioned the mission briefing because I was just about to do that, uh, that we speculate about transporting down to the secondary mm -hmm. hull and how intership beaming was a problem. As before we even researched the episode and the, the experts are saying the same things that we did in the mission briefing, which is cool. And also um, learned a lot in that script. That was a really fun, fun read. And I learned a lot. And it's always good to learn lots when you're in track mm -hmm. yards. But I will say, I think one thing I said at the time as well, I mean, you've got to think these ships are designed for a reason. So there's probably workarounds. And just like with mm -hmm. the Titan, I think we had the same discussion. Why wouldn't, you know, maybe this isn't necessarily a lived in area, but if you've got, what, eight hour shifts, so you know you're going to be in one zone for eight hours, why shouldn't there just be a retractable turbo lift shaft that just connects between the two? The single turbo lift goes up and down, and you just press some buttons, it, you know, it connects, mm -hmm. you get turbo lift up and down. It's like an elevator, I mean, the shaft doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't have to be there the whole time, yeah. and then if you spend your entire shift on the one thing, you only use it once or twice a day, why is it not retractable? Why do you have to use beaming all the time? Yeah, well, they kind of explained it in the uh, research that we did uh, early in the episode where it says that the engineering, hall, engin yeah. engineering section isn't even manned during normal operations. Yeah. It would only be during an, an emergency or something. And then again, I wouldn't want to be beaming down to it if we're having an emergency because, <laughs> you know, the writers, they tend to say that the tr transporter is not working. or something, Don't want to become so. 12 or two of me and, or... yeah. I can see it being a small enough ship that there's a Jeffrey's tube with a ladder in the struts because it wouldn't be that yeah. difficult to, you know, run the ladder real quick if it's such a small ship. Yeah. Right? So yeah. the turbo lift arguments kind of you don't need a turbo lift. That's just a convenience. And I'm yeah. sure if there's, they could fit a few t Jeffrey's tubes in those struts with no problem. So. And then you're right. If it's that small a vessel, I mean, you know, a, a yeah. one minute, you know, I mean, if, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're sleeping in bunks. Or it could even... It's an old school approach. Why are they mind to have, you know, just... Exactly. Down, uh, or, like in, or like in the NX-01 and even the uh, Enterprise D engine room, you got the little single man little thing mm. that goes down from one level to the next. Why can't they have that in the strut? You don't need a lot of room for that. Um, yeah. And it could actually move kind of on a slope down like this, you know? It, yeah. It, I, I always thought the bottom was probably manned because, again, science or cargo... It's so much of the room of the ship. You need at least some habitable areas. You don't want that just locked off entirely. Although no. I've seen you know, versions like the Ptolemy we talked about, you know, that has like these big tug bits, obviously they're not manned. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on the purpose. I mean, if the, ship, or if, if the ship all it needs is sensors and then the crew quarters and the life parts, I mean, you know, it, it's bigger than a space shuttle and they have all the same things. Yeah. You know, See, it's like, I think the older we get, the more we overthink it. Because like I said, as a kid, <laughs> there were no windows in that secondary hull. And it looks so different yeah. from the Enterprise's secondary hull. I just assumed it was all equipment. 
Yeah. Oh, but now that we get older, we're like, well, you know, the engineering room or the warp core should be down there, and we try to rationalize it. Um, but just looking at it first glance as a kid, I remember thinking that, yeah, it was probably just everybody's in the saucer, you know. Didn't really consider size. Although, to be fair, how many windows are there in the engineering room of the Enterprise D? None. It's the middle of the ship. Well, so no, you don't but need there's, windows. There's a, ton all, there's a ton all over the secondary hull, though. It shows that it's in, inhabited. Yes, but not in, if, that, if there is just the engineering room in here. Oh, true, yeah. You, that, that's, that's a staple to not have them in the engineering room. Why would you? It's like a steamboat. You know, you wouldn't, it's in the middle of the ship. You wouldn't have any windows. So I can, you know, I, I would, I think what core sort of makes sense down here because this needs to be as much livable room as possible. Although that said, for what cores up there, you know, the run between, you know, we're about to explode, let's go fix it. Doop, we ran the entire ship. You know, it's like twelve seconds. You know, it's an X star. Yeah. It's like it doesn't take very long to run the entire length of the ship. But yeah. small crew, small small mission. Although bunks for three years would not sound fun. Even the Excelsior has them, and they're as a huge ship, they still have bunks, so clearly it's, it's kind of a thing that just happens of that era. But I'd love to see what a TNG version would look like, like a proper mm. TNG bridge, TNG everything, how much they could have made it more luxurious, made it more functional. I mean, would they have cut the crew number because of automation mm. to allow everyone to have proper quarters, or would they have... You know, you know what I mean? Could they have put a holodeck yeah. in it? Would that have added decks room the need, maybe? So, yeah. For, yeah. Yeah, and I know over the years, even with uh, some of my older books, like the uh, Starfleet Dynamics books, mm. they got different versions of this. It's the same top module, um, but the pylons attached to like cargo modules and stuff at the bottom, which yeah. kind of talks about the subclasses they were talking about. Um, so it's a very versatile vessel if you take that into account. But then again, I think that only the top would be inhabitable because yeah. the bottom is interchangeable. Like you, as we've talked about with other ships, you could put you know, like um, personnel transports on there, things like that. Even like luxury liner attachments for the diplomatic missions, right? Yeah, sure. Have like a huge pool down there for the citation, yeah. for the whales, yes. like doing their whale things. That's how I took George and Gracie out on a little trip to the universe to show them, sorry guys, here's a nice cruise. Well, the one question I want to ask before we close out, yeah. and I've always wondered this, I want to know your thoughts. These warp engines, I mean, these are radically different to anything else. Mm -hmm. we've seen. I mean, they're so unrecognizably warp nacelles. They've just got this grilling, This there's no basards, there's no grill, blue grills. They're yeah. so simple. What was your thought on these? Because no one ever comments about how radically different the ship is. You know, look at Discovery, all the controversy of the ship's looking so different. This does not look like the Enterprise in any way, shape, or form. Yet mm -hmm. no one had a problem, because it's a different... It's for a different purpose. Different contractor, different build, you know different company building it it's more of a s civilian like a, s it's a s scientific research vessel it's not designed by the military or military even though it's not a military <laughs> starfleet yeah. um for the same purposes um so and we've talked about that before too with different ships even some of our uh trek yards originals mm -hmm. you know, different parts made by different companies you know having the bidding war as far as who won the contract eventually yeah especially with experimental ships like the Excelsior. So, yeah, I just saw it as something that was just a different contractor or a civilian ship that was... But do you like these engine designs? Because they're pretty yeah. different. Yeah, I think they're very cool. Uh, and the fact that it's so much smaller and can only go warp 5.8 is kind of cool as well, I think. So, yeah, I like it. Yeah, they're kind of like, you know, the the, the robust but not really state-of-the-art at all. You know, it's like, we yeah. can throw these good old, old reliable engines on her if you want. There's only about a tenner. Just a tenner. The big engine, the, the, the refit style on sales, it's about 200 quid. But these ones, i got ten of them yeah. lying around. Just yeah. take off my hands or a tenner. Warp five, it's fine. <laughs> and and the way they style them too, they're very retro. They look like old yep. uh, cars from the 50s. Yep. So they could be older style on the cells. Um, it's an older style ship. Uh, anyway. But, but also easily refittable. I mean, that you, yeah. know, you could easily upgrade the space frame. I kind of wish they did. I would love to have seen a TNG version. I mean, you know, obviously the miniatures are good because they made them for the movie but I'd love to have seen if they had a bit more flexibility to take those yeah. off pull on some hybrid D1 D ones you know uh, and sort of upgrade it a little bit we'd love to have seen that um, I mean it's not a difficult thing to get bash and CG but you know, it would be nice to see officially see what uh, really? like we saw the Miranda class it's like where well, they've got nacelles that are sort of upgraded sort of yeah I could see Voyager nacelles in place of these mm. the Voyager style um, but yeah. anyway yeah so I think that's it for the episode guys uh, hopefully you enjoyed it I know I learned a lot researching it, and I, I'm gonna watch Star Trek three next time and go, wow, mm -hmm. look at the deck sizes. How big is that thing? <laughs> Two meter deck. You gotta crouch down. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, well, so they, if they, you they like, just, they just bring small crew on board. 
Yes, all of um, what's his name, Kiesner, the, the yeah. little guy from the yeah. New well, okay, I was just gonna say five foot people, but okay, <laughs> <laughs> just 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 smaller crews on smaller it's, ships. It's the Ewok ship. You only have, yeah, you have like the, the Federation crew on the bridge, and that, the rest <laughs> of the ship is manned by the Ewoks. So the bridge is real know. scale. Everything else is is okay. I want to hear your thoughts, guys. Comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss yes. anything. And click the no bell notification icon so you'll be part of our notification squad, as all the, the, the YouTubers are calling it these days. Notification squad. That's, that's new to me. If you want to support the show directly, you can. There are a couple of great ways. You can support us directly on Patreon, which are YouTube's, uh, well, YouTubers love to use it because it helps us on a monthly basis. You give a little bit each and every month, like a lot of our amazing fans do. It goes directly into the production of the show, into keeping us with roofs and lights and food, which means we can do all the shows for you on a weekly basis or a one-time donation at trekyards.com. There's a big donate button. Click it, give us a tip, a thank you, or whatever, 10, 15, 20, a million bucks, whatever you can afford. But there is a free way, isn't there, Stuart? We do appreciate a lot. There is a free way. You can share it around, share it with anybody you think, any of the Star Trek groups out there that you're part of that might not have heard about Trek Yards, just share yeah. it on their page and spread the word. And this and is a classic just... ship that deserves it. Yeah, and yeah, and say good things about us, Team Trek Yards, because we're awesome. And on that note, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Commander Cox. And we will see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.